And it's time. Let's stand together. Open your Bible to Revelation chapter number 4. Look at verse number 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. As we began last class, we begin here this morning thinking about the fact that we have as our ultimate purpose, our ultimate why for living, to glorify and please God, to bring pleasure to Him, to see in His face. He said, seek my face. He said to us, He would have us to be guided by His eye. That's interesting, isn't it? He said, don't be like the horse where I got to put a bridle in your mouth. Don't be like the donkey. I got to beat you with a stick to get you going. Let me guide you with my eye. So we get to, we seek His face and we have such a fellowship with Him and walk with Him that just he looks like that and we sense the spirits moving and we move with him amen that's that's what he will that's what pleases him he doesn't like to have to drive us you know and all he'll chastise us if it's necessary but never with pleasure so let's please him by living our lives in a way before him that he's motivated and moved to say well done Father, thank you so much. I ask you to bless this time together in our class. And uh, Lord, help us, Lord, uh, as we prepare uh, these students for the work you have called them to. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And uh, we're going to begin by defining the three criteria for success in the classroom. Let's go ahead and get started. Page number seven in your textbook, a strategy for success in your classroom. A strategy for, uh, for classroom success. And we want to help you understand how to define success for yourself in the classroom. Now, your administrator is going to probably communicate specifically what it is he's looking for in the way of measuring your progress and measuring whether or not you have achieved what he's looking for or what she's looking for in the school, okay? That doesn't mean, however, you should not have an idea in your own mind of how to evaluate yourself, all right? Now here's what you don't do with what I'm gonna teach you next. You don't get hired onto a staff, onto a team, and when the administrator calls you in and gives you an evaluation, he doesn't use the criteria I'm gonna give you. You don't say, oh, excuse me, that's not the criteria by which my performance is to be measured. Promise me you're not gonna do that, right? That would be just really, really, really brain dead. That would be a huge mistake. You don't wanna go there. So. However, for your own personal uh, sense of progress, this will be helpful to you. It'll be helpful to you in another way. Not all administrators are good administrators. You know, a lot of, like I, like I said in the other class where we're training administrators, people get elevated to the position of leadership in a school sometimes because they're good teachers. But that doesn't mean they're good administrators, see? Happily, however, that means that the person who is your administrator will be very, very sensitive and aware of your pressures and of your concerns and of your perspective as a teacher. They'll get it and they'll be very helpful in terms of helping you to be good at the work of teaching because if they've been such a good teacher for that reason, they've been elevated to that position, then obviously they've got something to talk to you about, but they might not be good leaders, all right? <clears throat> now, you can help them if you're wise in how you go about it. You can help them with some of this information, but be very careful about it because, you know, sometimes a person is elevated to a position of leadership that they're not suited to because they don't have skills in the area of administration. Now, you can learn how to do that, all right? You can learn to be a good administrator. You're not necessarily born with that. Some people are born with a, a natural motivation. The Spirit speaks about it in Romans chapter 12 of ruling. They have certain instincts and intuitions that are kind of wired into their personality by God because God suited them for that kind of work. And so the, it is more natural for them. They can be greatly assisted if they learn more about why they do what they do and so on. But a teacher has a different set of motivations has a different set of instincts and a different set of intuitions. And that doesn't always work well in an administrative position. So a teacher has to work harder at learning 
how to administrate than a ruler would, but a ruler or a natural leader would have to take the time needed to learn the world of the teacher if he or she is going to be a good administrator of teachers. So I just want to help you with that kind of a preface, kind of a caveat, if you will. And now let's talk about a criteria for success in the classroom. Years ago, I asked a group of teachers to define success for me. I just said, hey, uh, tell me, what would, uh, what would be success? At the end of the school year, how, if you were going to evaluate yourself and hand to me your evaluation, what criteria would you use to determine whether or not you were successful. And I got a lot of different ideas, a lot of different, and by the way, most of them were good. What I ended up doing is taking all of those and saying, wow, you guys have instructed me. By the way, I served as a teacher before I served as an administrator. Uh, and, my, and my gifts are in the area of teaching, but I also have a, a lot of instincts and intuitions in the area of, of, uh, of, of, of administration. So it was, a, it was an easy transition for me. It wasn't hard, but, uh, but the, uh, but the teachers who are just really, that, that, that's what their thing is, man. They're, they're all about communicating information into the heart and mind and life of those children. That's their whole thing. Uh, they have a different perspective. And so um, it was helpful for me to have that perspective coming in. But when I listened to my teachers tell me what it was they were, they were looking for from themselves as success, it totally missed the administrative concerns. All right? It was all about the student learning, the student becoming a, a person equipped to fulfill their purpose for God. And it was beautiful stuff, beautiful. And it was great. And I, would, and I encouraged every one of my teachers. I said, I said you know, uh, Mrs., Mr. Fitzgerald, this is awesome. Man, I mean, own this and go for this in your, in your classroom. And then another teacher, uh, Sh uh, Bonnie Sharoma, uh, she was one of my better teachers, and hers was just beautifully written and perfect. I said, that is awesome. Please go for that. Promise me that you'll go for that in your classroom. And I handed it back to her. And I did that with every single one, because every one of them did a good job of communicating a heart that wanted the kids to learn, a heart that wanted to communicate truth to the heart of a child that would be there for that child in the days they're making the, they're making the decisions and all that kind of good stuff, amen? I love it. But it totally missed my concerns. Not totally, well, maybe not totally, but so now I'm gonna to talk to you like an administrator, all right? So hopefully, though, I connected with your heart as a teacher, hopefully. Now let me talk to you as an administrator. So I had in view specific objectives in the area of academics and, of course, in re-enrollment. Obviously, the teachers are there not to make a salary, but they got to make a salary to be there. Duh. You know what I mean? They do. <clears throat> if, you, if you can't pay them, they can't stay and do the wonderful things they communicated to me that they wanted to do. So as the administrator, I gotta think in terms of, you know what, I've gotta have students for these teachers. I've gotta have students in these classrooms, and I've got to, uh, in, in order to uh, perform for the money these parents are paying me, I've got to give them a product. Oh man, I hope I'm not losing you now, but I'm preparing you to be a teacher in, a, in an environment where you're gonna run in. I mean, those are concerns that are legitimate. And what I'd like you to do is be able to own those as legitimate objectives and legitimate concerns. And it's only if those objectives begin to compromise the, the real reason you're there, and that's to communicate truth to the heart of a child, truth that'll be there for them as a compass to guide them in the decisions they have to make in the future. Man, if you're not memorizing these statements, you're missing it. These are awesome statements of purpose for a teacher. Am I not right? Am I right? They are. Get hold of that. That's what you want. But the administrator has to make sure you've got students to teach. And the administrator has to make sure you're fed well enough so you can think clearly when you're teaching. I mean, you know, it, it does come to that place where you just have to be practical about some things. And so my objectives as an administrator, after, after, I received their heart 
and saw what they wanted and said, yes, that's what we want. Then I had to say, now, here's what I want in order for you to be able to do that. I want to I wanna produce. I, I, the teacher in me doesn't want to say this. The administrator in me totally gets it. I got to produce a product. I got teachers, I got parents giving me money with an expectation that I'm going to give them an educated kid. Right? I mean, it just gets down to that place at some point. And so I've got to produce the product. Second, I got to get them to come back. So when I evaluate the organizational structure, I'm looking at it like this. I've got to achieve a certain product level of quality and I have got to get these parents so um, convinced that this is the place where they can get that product that they will bring their children back and re-enroll and of course make a good impression among the community so we can increase our enrollment and the, church and the school can grow. I wanted an academic average of 90%. Now that's ridiculous. Where did I come up with that? Well, I meant, remember I worked as a teacher. And a lot of the stuff I'm going to communicate to you came from my time as a teacher, not my time as an administrator, say. But it came while I was working as a teacher. And my class averaged 90% academic average. Classroom. Now, how did we achieve that? I'm going to communicate to you what I did in that classroom that helped me achieve that. And then as administrator, I said, you know what, I'm going to take these ideas that I use in that classroom to achieve that, and I'm going to communicate them to my entire teaching staff, and I'm going to make it a goal for 90% academic average. Now, I did not measure my teachers by that goal, all right? I didn't say, uh, if you don't reach a 90% academic average in your classroom, then you're not doing what I want you to do. I'm going to get another teacher. No. There are too many variables. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the, the, the list of variables are just almost not any. They're practically infinite. And there's no way you can control all the variables. So, no, I, don't, I didn't do that. Here's what we did instead. <clears throat> we created what we call a class profile for the students. And we did that from our September's testing. So in September, when the kids first got to the school, we spent the first two weeks. See, this is almost counterintuitive. Here I want um, a 90% academic average, but I'm not even going to start their curriculum until two weeks into the school year. I want to spend the first week teaching the kids how my class is organized. Now, that's not all we did, but it was most of what we did. And so the stuff we learned together, you know, the principles of authority, subordinate relations and all that, I was teaching that to seventh and eighth graders. Of course, I used a little different level of language <laughs> and I had some different strategies and approaches to that, but we taught them that material. And I taught them very clearly what I expect. And we, and we went into a lot of other stuff we didn't have time to go into in this particular course, where I talked to them about, uh, you know, what are your goals, Johnny? What, do, you want to, do you want to be a person that's considered intelligent and that knows things? Do you, want, do you like to know things? When someone asks you a question, is it enjoyable when you know the answer? And of course the kids are going, yeah, yeah. How do you feel when you don't know the answer? They get the kids talking. Well, I don't like that. Well, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you learn how to get the answers. I'm not going to be able to pack into your head the answer to every question you're ever going to hear. But what I'm going to do is teach you how to get the answers when you need them. See? So I'm, it made sense to them. So the kids understood what my job was or what my role was connected to what their interest was. Okay? That's a very important job. So I did all that work in that first week. In the second week, we did testing. And I used at that time the CAT, California Achievement Test. And then we used uh, something I call the JWS mechanics test. That's because my name is Jerry Wayne Scheibach and I, and I invented the test. Right. <laughs> but when I, when I say I invented the test, you need to understand I plagiarized terribly and un unabashedly. <laughs> Here's what I did. I took the curriculum I was given to teach and I created a test from that curriculum to see where they were relative to the curriculum I was going to teach them. So I had a real clear idea of where every single one of my students was at with regard to the curriculum I was about to teach them. I also had another te uh, test called the mechanics test. Or did I already mention that? No. Yeah, there was a mechanics test that I gave all my students every single year. Even if they've taken it 15 times, I'd change it up a little bit so it'd be a little new. But the mechanics test, I was interested in their reading skill, 
their arithmetic skill, their language skill. All right? Can they read? Do they understand grammar at certain rudimentary levels? And can they manipulate numbers satisfactorily to their age level? And I call that the mechanics test. That's a lot of testing. But I try to make it fun, I try to make it interesting in different ways. Uh, it, it, you know, and, and we always try to emphasize the connection between what they're doing with what their need is. And so I would remind them often, OK, class, is it fun to know? When you're asking, is it fun to know? And the kids got to place go, yeah, you know. OK, well, that's what we're here to do, teach you how to have the answers when you need them, how to find them when you, you know, this. I remind them of that all the time. Not, when I say all the time, I don't mean every minute of every day. You know? But almost as many times as I'm reminding you. Well, maybe not. <laughs> but my point is, the kids were constantly reminded of the relationship between what it is I was doing in that classroom and their interests. And when you make a connection between what you're doing and the interests of the student, you've got a dynamic connection there that's going to open them up to what you're trying to do and what you're trying to communicate to them. Yeah, look at page 10. Now, of course, this is uh, after about 10 permutations. You know what I mean? This, this isn't the way it was the first day I used it. But it, this is, we call this the student profile. Obviously, date, the information that you would put in there. But what I'm doing here is I'm going to indicate their test scores. I found out, of course, something that's, that it, intuitively everybody knows. If a kid can read, they can learn. <laughs> you know, if, if a child can, uh, uh, can manipulate numbers, well, then they're going to, that's what they need is a foundation for learning math. And math's a very important mental function as well that I don't have time to go into. And then language, you know, if they know how to understand where the comma goes and they get all that kind of stuff, they can then read with comprehension better. Then those are the fundamentals, those are the mechanics that I use then to communicate and to build a knowledge base for that student. And then I would look at last year's bi-weekly scores. What in the world is a bi-weekly score? I gave every student a report card every two weeks. Now, I know as an administrator, and I knew then as a teacher, that report card time is the most difficult time for a teacher's life. <laughs> because it's all this, getting all these grades together, and hey, yay, yay. Well, I wanted to find out where my students were every two weeks. I didn't like going you know, a whole uh, semester or a quarter before I discovered I was having a problem developing in the classroom. Now, there are other ways to, de to discover where there's a problem developing, but there's no more clear way and more objective way than creating a kind of report card for me every two weeks. I sat down with my grade book, and I created a report on every student on where they were tracking, and how they were trending, and I would compare that to their student profile. Because the student profile, uh, after I studied all their tests, then I would, I would take a shot at what I think that student should do, where their grade should be, where they should be tracking in their grades on their assignments. And th so I put that number down. Then I had a personal goal for that student to kind of uptick that a little bit, right? So I would say, here's, here's what I expect that student to do. This is the line. If they drop below that line, I got a problem. See? If they hit that line, we're, we're, on, we're on target, we're good. But my hope was to kind of move it up toward the end of the school year. And that's how I operated. So every two weeks I had uh, basically a report card. Then I got on the idea, hey, you know, the parents could be helpful here. And so at the end of each uh, two week period, I created these report cards and I got permission to hand them out to all my parents. So the parents would get it, sign it, and bring it back. That was, that proved to be just hugely helpful for a whole lot of reasons. One of them was this, it totally eliminated the whole surprise on, on parent day, you know. None of this, that never happened to me. I never had a parent walk in and then hear me tell them about their student and be surprised. Why? They'd been told every two weeks where the student was at. It also brought the students, uh, the parents into a problem if a problem was developing that parents could get in there and I could, I could tell them uh, on the parent notice, on the back somebody would write a note, please spend a little more time reading with Johnny or doing this or doing that or then you just give a little prescription, if you will, of what could be done at home to kind of help improve this problem or that problem. Um, and that approach was just awesome in terms of uh, creating rapport with the students because the students liked knowing they did. They liked knowing, even if they were if they were doing a little bad, you know. It, it, well, one thing it's like it's like supervision, always has this effect. It communicates interest in what 
the uh, team is doing, doesn't it? Supervision communicates interest. It communicates a lot of things, but one of the things it communicates is interest. When the students saw how interested I was in their progress, they began to get interested in their progress. So it has all kinds of wonderful effects that are very, very beneficial uh, to the teacher. So we would uh, take the first two weeks of school time to establish biblical principles of relationship between teacher-student, biblical principles on relationship between the, the teacher and the parent, biblical principles that would govern a learning, you know, how that the, the fool's ears are closed to learning, but a wise heart will learn. And what's the difference between a wise heart and a foolish heart? And we would talk about that in the classroom and motivate the children to desire a wise heart and then give them that promise. God said, if you, if you cry and ask for wisdom, he'll give it to you, all this kind of, we did all that work in the first week. And then the second week, we did the testing, and then we have the, <clears throat> the student profile, and we go into the school year just awesome. It was great because, uh, again, parents loved it. The students liked it. I liked it. Basically, at first, I just did it for myself. <clears throat> but after a short time, we began hitting 90% academic average. Just a quick question. Sure. Um, the biweekly report you do give to the parents, is the student profile just for you? or is that Student profile is only for me. Although there are times when I communicated it to the parents. If I saw the, ch the student profile was so weak that I knew that student was going to struggle in my class, then I would ask for a, a parent-teacher conference and sit down with the parent and go over the profile. Why? Well, as a teacher, I mean, I just wanted the parent to know that here's what we're working with and here's what you can do to help me. As an administrator, it took on a, a new significance. I wanted to be able to make sure the parent understood that I can only do so much here. <laughs> I mean, because what happened is our school became known as the school that had a 90% academic, blah, blah, blah. And so parents with troubled kids that weren't doing well thought, boy, that's the school for my kid, right? Thanks. So I got a lot of these challenging situations. So the students, and we didn't screen for academic uh, issues. We only screened for behavior. <clears throat> we, we always said, if the child will listen, the child will learn. A child that listens, learns. A child that doesn't, doesn't. It's really very simple. Uh, you can give me a listening, learning child, and I'll give you teaching. <laughs> you give me a child that's fighting me every step of the way, and then I can't really do very much for you, and you're wasting your money. See? So that's how we screen. So we would get these students who, were, who would sometimes, you know, we get three or four of them in almost every school year. They're new to the school. <coughs> their, <coughs> their student profile, boom, pulled my average down. Hmm, really bad. And it wouldn't be fair, would it, to evaluate a teacher on an average they had in a class one year to the next year if we, brought, we gave that teacher five underperforming students. That's why we didn't evaluate them on my goal of a 90% academic average. We evaluated them on the class profile. But uh, so what happens is I get all these bi-weekly sent to my desk first. So as the administrator, I saw every one of them. And a student body of 265 students, it was, it was quite, a, quite a task. You know, you get 265 of these things uh, processed through my office at the end of every two week period. And I got them all back to the teachers within three days. So yeah, I told the other class, I said, this business of burning midnight oil, staying up late, working hard, <laughs> it doesn't get better. Just thought I'd encourage you. <clears throat> so 265 of these things that come in, and I'm working through every single one of them, looking at every one of them, and then I would average that class and check the, the class profile. If it came under, if the teachers, uh, if the students biweeklies averaged together came under the class profile, then we had a teacher uh, principal meeting. I would call for a meeting. They weren't in trouble. Nobody's in trouble yet. You see, in our system, the only time you ever got in trouble is if they didn't do what they were told to do. So what, the deal I made with the teachers was this. I would say, okay, team, here's how it goes. You do what I ask you to do. I'm responsible for the results. If you do what I ask you to do, then that's all I'm gonna, that's all you're gonna be evaluated on. Period. There's nothing else. I mean, if, I, assuming you're a decent teacher. Now, of course, we did all that before we hired them. You know, that, the whole point is what you want to do is this. 
you want to show your students you are interested in their progress. Now, whatever way you go about doing that, you may have another way to do it, all right? But you want to show them you're interested. And it's a good idea to communicate to the parents how the students are progressing more than just once a quarter, you know? It's better to get ahead of these things rather than to get behind them. On page 46, we have something called the incentive contract. Now, we didn't start the first contract until after the first two-week period. After the first two-week period, it gave me a sense then of a kind of a, a here's how the student's going to perform, all right? I had my expectations going in from the testing, but now I've got my first proof of the pudding type thing, my first taste of the pudding to prove it. And I can say, well, okay, here's what, here's what, we're, here's what we are, bingo. <clears throat> and then I would call the students to my desk while the others were working on something, one at a time, and I would, I would have thought this through already, and I have their name on it already, the form already filled out up to the point where we talk about the work required. And I would say, now for you, uh, first of all, I, I would talk about the reward. You know, I've learned enough about my students to have some idea of what, they, what, what motivates them. You know, dogs are different. The kids aren't dogs, but I'll use an illustration. We have a little pug, and we have this huge shepherd with these two dogs, and they are so different in their motivation. Willie, he's our one-eyed pug. Yeah, he's an awesome dog. If I ever can, I'll bring him. <laughs> you would love to meet one-eyed Willie. Lost his eye, we rescued him, it's one of those things. I love this little dog. But he's motivated by food. Food motivates that dog. My shepherd, actually it's my son's shepherd, she's a beautiful, thoroughbred German shepherd, just a beautiful animal, sleek, Elegant, oh, man, she could be a show dog, but her tail's too long. The only problem, I keep telling her, if you just didn't have just a long tail, I could make some money off you. But anyway, <clears throat> but she's a beautiful, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> That's the administrator in me, you understand? But anyway, so uh, here's, the, here's this beautiful shepherd, a you know, little bit dog. This little guy motivated by food. She could care less about food. Can you believe that? There aren't many dogs like this. But this dog, we had to, we had to coax her to eat. She wanted to play, play. That dog, the first thing she does when she sees me or anybody, she runs and grabs a toy and comes running to you. She wants to play. The little guy, he runs and looks at me, sits down with his little teeth, with bottom roll going, and I know what he wants. I want some food. So they're motivated differently. <clears throat> For some kids, you know, a little treat is like, wow, for others, a little more time in play, you know, this kind of thing. So we had a status system, BCS for the school's initials, Baptist Christian Schools, <clears throat> and, and B status was certain privileges, and C status was certain privileges, and S status was certain privileges. We even had a system where if the student performed like they were supposed to perform, they could have a day off. You know, literally stay home the whole day. Of course, parents didn't always like that. But we learned to work with the parents too. Parents have to be a part of this, by the way. They have to approve the reward. Decide on a reward for each student. Think through the student's profile. Think through what you know about the student. Decide on a reward. Sit down with the student and say, hey, would you like this? Yeah. All right. Will you give me something for it? Uh, what do you want? How about this? And I'll list the things I want them to do. Now, I've even had this happen. I'm listening through the first thing, the kid's going, yeah. Second thing. And pretty soon the kid's losing interest. Yeah, that's not worth that reward. They're not saying that, right? And I'll notice that, I go, hmm, tell you what, I'm gonna add something to that reward. And I'll add a little bit. How about this? Kid gets motivated again. So you're buying them, you bet. No, I'm just kidding around. <clears throat> no, <clears throat> I'm trying to make a connection between the work I want him to do and his or her interests, right? That's a working situation. When I can connect what I want from them for something they want or with something they want, then I can get them moving. <clears throat> and it has to be wholesome things and you know, appropriate things. I mean, all those criteria have to play into this, of course. <clears throat> but, uh, and, and now there'll be some students, you, nothing, eh, nothing, nothing, nothing. You know, the only thing that I want is for you to not make me work in this classroom at all. Uh -huh. all right? Well, that student, 
it, here's what I would do. And I, there are very few of those, by the way, that I ever ran into. But there are a few of them. I just go through and say, okay, well, you don't, you don't care about that. But you're going to have to do this, this, or this, or these will be the consequences. All right? So instead of reward, I'm talking consequences. Okay? All right? So it's reward or consequences. They can work for a reward or they can work to avoid a consequence. I'd much rather they work for a reward. <clears throat> so that's the incentive contract. And then other conditions might, be, might play into here. Sometimes the parents will say to me stuff like, you know, I can't get that kid to take the trash out. And I heard that maybe in a parent-teacher conference or I heard it somewhere or whatever, picked it up. Here's what I'll do often. I sit down with a student, I go through all this. Not, your mom has had trouble with you taking out the trash. Now I'm going to add that as a stipulation here. Of course, you don't use the word stipulation with kindergartners. And I'd say, all right, so I'm going to put that in. You take the trash out for your mother when she asks you to take it out. That's going to be part of this contract. See? Parents love this stuff. All right? Because it helped them at home. <clears throat> and then we evaluate. Uh, if, sometimes it'll be a two-week thing. Sometimes it'll be a three-week, some four-week, sometimes five-week. All right? I never made a contract more than five weeks long. <clears throat> but, and most of them were two week long. And so I would evaluate it. And so at the end of the first week, I'd say, okay, looks like you're on track. This is awesome. Or you fell back. Boy, you better do this, this, and this to catch up in order you're not, you're not going to get your reward. See, that kind of thing. And uh, then the student would sign it, the parent would sign it, and I would sign it. And it would be dated. And then that's what we use. And that incentive contract, oh man, that thing worked well. I mean, it was just awesome. But what does all of this spell for you, the teacher? It's a four-letter word. And I'm not trying to be funny with the four-letter word here. But it's a four-letter word. It starts with the letter W. Yeah, that's right. It goes to the letter O. It goes to the letter R, and it ends with the letter K. You're going to have to work to make this thing work. It does take work. Amen. And some teachers just don't want to work. They like teaching because they like, you know, Yant talks about the dramatic performance aspect of teaching. And, and there are several different aspects of teaching that Yant goes into. And they're all very good. That's why we got this book for you. That's why we want you to read it. But uh, some teachers, they simply enjoy putting on a show, to, you know, with the kids. Some teachers just like the interaction. Some, you know, teachers have different motivations. And none of those motivations are particularly bad. But at the end of the day, it's going to take work. You're going to have to be really, really committed to these kids. You won't do everything that I'm going to suggest to you here because you don't work for me in my school. <laughs> All right? But these things are going to give you ideas. And you'll, you'll probably shape it a little differently. And you'll be working in an environment where some of these things won't work because that environment is one that doesn't allow for it. I get that, you know, of course. And I'm not going to be there to supervise you and all this. I'm going to give you the information. You're going to go out of here and do whatever you want with it. I just hope you go out of here with a heart to communicate truth to hearts, truth that'll be there when that kid's faced with decisions they have to make that'll make the decision, that make the difference between who knows, I mean, life and death, it can mean that, uh, a life of happiness and productivity or a life of misery and failure. I mean, you know, you're going to make a lot of difference. And you go in there, and that's, that's your passion. That's what you want to achieve. And then this stuff gives you tools, tools, things you can think about. To, you know, I got this student that's not performing. I wonder if an incentive contract would work with him. You might not do it for every student in every class. But you might say, you know, that student, that, this might really work for that student. And then this biweekly report, you might not do it for every student. But maybe you'll do it for those students that are having some trouble. And you'll start tracking them bi-weekly or all that. Or, but once you get into a routine, it really, it didn't feel like a lot of work. In fact, it just felt like spending time with my students. See? That kind of work is in, under your belt. What time do I have? Two more I got two more minutes. That kind of work invested in these students makes them want to work for you. I guarantee it. You invest that in your students. And you're going to have students who are loyal to you who will not want to fail. They will want to succeed, see? And you want to put that in them, that fire. That they'll go out of the classroom with it and do something with their life. Amen?
That's your objective. That's what you want to see happen. Let's stand together. Well, Father, I want to thank you for these uh, teachers who want to go into a classroom and instill, not just throw a bunch of words into the ears of these kids, but Lord, to, to work information into the heart, truth that will serve as a foundation upon which they will build a life. And so help them, Lord God, in that. And I pray these tools, these mechanics that we're talking about will serve them to that end. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.